Yes, välkommen tillbaka till andra föreläsningen idag när vi håller populärvetenskapliga föreläsningar inom Bolinscentrets klimatfestival. Vi byter till engelska för att den här föreläsningen kommer att hållas på engelska. So welcome to the second lecture of today. Uh, the lecture is titled Who Wants to be a Climate Scientist? And it will be given by three uh, students, two PhD students and one who has actually compute, uh, completed the PhD. We start the presentation with uh, Carolina Siegel, who is a PhD student at the Department of Meteorology at Stockholm University. And then Carolina will introduce her colleagues a little later on into her presentation. So, Carolina, what's your good? Carolina, you need to unmute yourself. I realize that, yes. So, thank you, Nina. <laughs> yeah, so welcome everyone to this talk, um, Who Wants to be a Climate Scientist, where you will meet me, Carolina, the cloud scientist, the glacier scientist, Anna, and the microclimate scientist, Carly. And we are all PhD students in climate science. And before I start talking about my life as a, a cloud scientist, I would just like to take a, a minute to explain to you what a PhD student actually is. But what is a PhD student? In Swedish, we call PhD student doktorand or forskarstuderande. And it is the highest academic degree that you can get. And PhD stands for Doctor of Philosophy. Although you can be a doctor in many different topics, not only philosophy, it's called Doctor of Philosophy. And normally the route to a PhD is First, a bachelor's degree of three years at the university. Then you do a master's degree of two years. And after that, you can get a PhD degree after four to five years of education. And we are students on a PhD program, but we are also employed by the university. So it is like a full time job with a salary, but at the same time, we are also students, so it's a bit um, strange in that sense, but also very uh, rewarding. And the goal of this program is to learn to become an independent researcher. So a little bit about me and why I end up here. So in 2009, I uh, got my degree from high school in Uppsala in Naturvetenskap or science in English. And in 2015, I became a chemical engineer, civil engineer, from KDH in Stockholm. And in 2017, I started my PhD in aerosol chemistry. And honestly, when I started my PhD, I didn't know that much about aerosols. Because with my chemical engineering background, my idea of aerosols was basically this. That's what comes out of a a spray can. But now I know a lot more about aerosols and I hope I can uh, explain that to you as well, why they are important for climate and what aerosols actually are. First of all, aerosols are really, really small. And as a climate scientist, I'm mostly interested in this size of aerosols. They are less than 2.5 micrometers in diameter. And as a comparison, um, yeah, you can compare to the human hair um, or fine beach sand, so you can understand how small they really are, and they are not visible by the naked eye, but they are everywhere around us. Okay, so where do we find aerosols? One type of aerosols that you probably have heard quite a lot about the previous year are viruses and bacteria. So when a person sneezes or coughs or talks or sings or even just breathes, 
um, they produce small droplets that are uh, emitted to, to the air. And inside these droplets are aerosol particles, like you know, to the right here are coronavirus particles that are trapped in these small uh, droplets in the air. And another place where we can find aerosols is the atmosphere. For example, we have sulfate aerosols come from volcanoes and factory emissions, among others. We can have dust from deserts, organic compounds and soot from forest fires or just from, from the living forest, and also sea spray aerosols. That's mainly sea salt coming from when the waves break in the ocean. And here you can see an animation of these different kinds of aerosols made by NASA. And you can see that these different aerosols, they are somewhat located to their source, like the dust is emitted from the deserts, um, the sulfate from countries where we have a lot of industries like North America and Europe and China, organics and soot from the big forests like the Amazon, and, and sea spray from the ocean. But you can also see that they are not, they can be transported to some extent. They are not completely located. They are not completely spread out either, but uh, it's not completely obvious where you find these different types of aerosols. And another thing is that we need aerosols to keep warm clouds in the atmosphere. So without any particles, we don't have any clouds. So I will show you also a little movie here made by my two um, colleagues. They have in this thermos 85 degree water, but you don't see any steam because there are no particles around. And then when they turn on the lighter, the lighter produces small particles where the water can condense. And in this way, you can say that they have produced a small cloud. And this is also exactly what happens in the atmosphere. Okay, so why are the clouds important for the climate? So from the sun, we have radiation or light you know, coming to the Earth's surface. And it hits the Earth's surface when we don't have any clouds. And some of this is reflected back, but most of it is actually absorbed by the surface and re-emitted as heat to the atmosphere. However, when we have cloud, in the atmosphere. Um, you all know when a cloud comes up from the sky that it gets cold and dark, right? Because it acts a bit like a mirror of the Earth and it reflects a lot of this incoming solar light. But they can also act in another way. It can be like a cozy blanket for the Earth. So the heat that is emitted by the surface can be um, taken up by the cloud and also this prevents the heat to escape the Earth, and this can then make the heat stay closer to the surface. So in these ways, clouds are very important for, for the climate on these planets. So my research is mainly focused on the Arctic and clouds in the Arctic. And the Arctic is the place around the North Pole, as you can see on this map. And it's also the home for polar bears and many other uh, lovely species, um, although that's not what I will talk about right now. It's also the place on Earth where climate change is more faster than anywhere else on Earth. It's warming very rapidly, and no one really understands why this is the case. There are guesses, but um, it's not completely clear why this happens so fast here. So a normal work day for me, or more like a normal work day for me in the summer of 2018 was when I went on this expedition to the North Pole uh, with this group of scientists on the Swedish iceberg rodent. So for eight weeks, I did lab work at the North Pole. I was measuring gases from the ocean 
and I was also collecting aerosols from the air. And for this, I would like to show you, hope you can see for the camera, we use this kind of, it's called an impactor. So through this impactor, we pull air from the atmosphere. And inside each of these stages, we can put filters. And on this uh, filter, we collect aerosols. So when we later remove the filters, we want to freeze them in liquid nitrogen. And that's what I'm showing here to the right, because we want to stop all kinds of chemical reactions going on on the filters. We want to have them as similar as they are in the atmosphere. Um, so that's why we do that. And with the analysis that I'm using, uh, we can see really detailed, we gotta get a really detailed picture of these aerosol spots, what they are, made of. So we can see, for example, that they are made of uh, fatty acids, that's the upper one, or other kinds of molecules that seem to come mainly from the ocean. And this is also very important to know because when climate change goes on, we need to know what will happen with the system and if we can expect more or less of these types of aerosols and how that will also affect the clouds in the future. So a more normal work day, I would say, back in Stockholm, consists of data processing and writing, and also meetings with the supervisor and co-workers. And this is um, to write manuscripts that we can publish to make our data available for everyone. And I also give presentations like today and attend workshops and conferences to learn more and present what we, what we find in our research. So now I have told you a little bit about um, what I'm doing. And apparently, according to this very non-scientific uh, survey made by phdcomics.com, uh, when you tell non-academics about the research, the most common response is, first thing is, why? Okay, so I hope that most of you don't say why. I hope I have uh, managed to explain that well enough during these 10 minutes or so. Okay, some of you will say, huh, or just give up blacks there. Well, that's fine. Uh, but most of you will currently say, well, you must be smart. So with that, I would also like to end with saying that even for a PhD student, internet and research engines are also our best friends. Um, a PhD is about learning and being a researcher is a lot about learning. And if you have the interest for your topic and a motivation to do research, those are the most important things for doing a PhD in climate science. So with that, I would like to hand over to Hannah, our Glacier PhD student. Thank you. Um, yes, I'll just bring up my slides here. Yeah. Okay, I hope those are showing okay. Uh, thanks, Carolina, a really nice talk. Um, so yes, hi, uh, I'm Hannah, and I'm a PhD student in the Physical Geography Department here at Stockholm University. And for the past three years now, I've been studying glaciers, or more specifically, the ground in front of glaciers and what this can tell us about our past, past climate. Now, as a um, throughout this talk, I'm going to be talking to you a bit about how I got into being a scientist looking at glaciers, why it's important that we're looking at these glaciers, and then also what it is I do on a day to day basis. So what sort of stuff I'm looking at. But first of all, why am I doing a PhD? If you'd asked me 10 years ago whether I'd ever consider doing a PhD, I probably would have laughed. 
in my head, PhDs were very smart people who fully understood the world around them. And that definitely didn't feel like me. But then as I went on to do my bachelor's and then my master's, I found that the more I learned about the world around me, the more questions I actually had and the more I wanted to learn. So by the time I got to the end of my master's, I wasn't ready to stop learning and I wanted to continue within this system. I've always been quite curious about the world and the landscapes that we see out there and how they have formed and what sort of processes have gone on. So when I finished high school back in 2012, I went on to do a degree in Earth Sciences with Geography uh, over in the UK and then also with a year in New Zealand. So this degree gave me a good overview of sort of how our world works and the sort of processes that are going on there. But I still felt like I wanted to go deeper. I wanted to learn more about some of these processes. And I felt I didn't quite have some sort of technical tools to look at this. So that's when I then went on to do a master's. For my master's, I was studying exploration geophysics at uh, Leeds University. Now, exploration geophysics is actually most commonly used in the oil and gas industry. So for my master's degree, during my project, I was working for an oil and gas company up in Scotland looking for a gas province in the North Sea. And while I found this work was really interesting and challenging, and it was great to sort of get into the geophysical data, it wasn't a field that I wanted to get into. I didn't feel satisfied with what I was doing, and it wasn't a career path that I felt was right for me. I wanted to apply these sort of geophysical skills that I'd learned to something that was more useful, that I could see a future in, and that I felt was contributing something good. And that's where I found this PhD project. So this PhD project, I was able to apply these geophysical skills that I'd learned to something that had really interested me during my bachelor's, so to glaciers. So in my project, what am I looking at? And why am I looking at this? Well, glaciers around the world are retreating. This is something that we all know. But what we want to know more about is sort of how they're retreating and how they're going to continue to retreat in the future as our climate inevitably continues to warm. One great way to look at what's going to happen in the future is to actually look at what happened in the past. And an area that contains a lot of information about what these glaciers were doing in the past is that ground in front of the glacier or the glacial foreland because this is the area that used to be covered by the ice. So the material that we find there has been worked by the ice and can tell us about what the ice was doing in the past. So sort of how the ice was moving and when it was moving. And if we can understand that, we can use that along with models to then predict what these glaciers are gonna do moving forward as our climate changes. Now, in my project, I am trying to look underneath the ground to see what's going on inside these sediments, so the material in front of the glacier. And so I'm using technique of geophysics. Traditionally, to look under the ground, we use something called sedimentology, which involves digging a hole and then actually looking what's down there. But as you can probably imagine, in these glacial forelands, this sort of land in front of the glacier, where there's a lot of ice and there's a lot of boulders. It's very hard to dig holes uh, and you're only getting a very restricted view of what's going on. Now geophysics, this allows us to look what's going on under the ground without having to dig those holes. So we're instead using energy to see what's going on under the ground. We send pulses of energy down into the ground and then those reflect off sort of boundaries between materials with different properties. So for example, if you've got sand and then underneath that you've got rock, the energy is going to bounce off that interface and it returns to the surface. And we use the time that it's taken for the energy to go down into the ground and come back up again. And we record that and that can tell us where these boundaries are and what sort of materials we're looking at. 
So from that, we can build up a picture of what's going on under the ground. A bit like, for example, how doctors use ultrasounds to take a look inside the human body. We're doing that, but we're applying that to the ground. So in our project, we're using two geophysical techniques, uh, one that's called ground penetrating radar or GPR, and this is using electromagnetic energy. Uh, so we're looking at where there's contrast in electrical properties, for example, something that's got more water in it than something else. And then we're also applying seismic techniques. Now seismics, uh, we're using energy that's similar to what you're getting from an earthquake, but in our case, it's on a much smaller scale because we're creating this energy by swinging a sledgehammer and smacking it on a plate. So we swing that sledgehammer, smack it on the plate, and that creates seismic waves which travel into the ground. And then we record them with a series of what we call geophones. And we can, from that, figure out more about what the strength of the material is like. So for example, if you've got very soft sand and then you've got hard bedrock, hard rocks, you can see uh, where the interface is between them. And then we're combining these geophysical techniques with that more traditional sedimentology or digging a hole to actually get to see what these sediments look like um, and sort of compare that to what we can find in the geophysics. Now we're applying these techniques to the foreland of a glacier called Mikdalsbreen, which is part of the Hardanger Yertle and ice cap over in southern Norway. If you've ever taken the train between Oslo and Bergen, about halfway along, there's a little tiny stop called Finsa, and that's about 10 kilometers from where Mittdalsbreen is, where we do our studies. So it means it's generally very easy to access. Uh, so we can go and apply these techniques to the foreland of Mittdalsbreen and see how they work and optimize them there. And then what we can find from Mittdalsbreen, we can then apply that to other areas across the world. If we can figure out what's going on at this accessible glacier, then we can use that information to help with studies in more remote sites across the rest of the world and figure out what our glaciers are doing and how they're going to change going into the future. So in terms of what I'm actually doing in my PhD, how we're applying these studies. Well, as I've shown, my field site's over in Norway. So on a normal year, I would spend about two weeks in the spring over there collecting geophysical data, so swinging a sledgehammer and getting um, seismic data or dragging along my GPR or ground penetrating radar equipment. But then when I come in, then in the summer, I go back for another two weeks and dig some holes and do the actual sedimentology and look at the sediments there. And then that's only a small portion of what I spend my time doing as my PhD. Then we come back and we, I spend a lot of time in the office on my computer, looking at this data, processing the data, and then analyzing it to see what information we can actually get out from it. I also spend a lot of time reading what other people have done in that sort of area so that we can fit this work that we're doing into the wider picture. And then we write um, academic papers and then also give presentations like today, but also at conferences with other people within the field, because a really important part of science is actually making sure that we can communicate what we learn. It's all very well us going out there and getting a nice understanding of what's going on at these glaciers. But if we don't communicate that science, it's not really of any use to anyone. And then beyond my actual project, as part of the PhD, it's still an education. So we take courses which can sort of help with our PhD education. So for example, I spent a month up in Svalbard learning how glaciers actually work because coming into the PhD, I didn't have much of a background in glaciers. There was, I still had a lot to learn. Um, so yeah, we're able to take courses to help with our PhD. And then also, as well as learning, we're also teaching. So I spend time teaching students, which I find really re rewarding to see other people getting infused about what I think is really exciting. So back to that question of why I'm doing a PhD. Well, I hope this has given you a little bit of a flavour of what a PhD involves, what we spend our days doing from swinging sledgehammers up on glaciers to scrolling through data and talking to other people about what we've learned. 
I'm not going to say that every day is a great adventure. Some days it can be very frustrating when your coding won't work or your data's not making any sense or you can't get out to the field. But overall, I think that it's a massive privilege to be able to work as a researcher, to be able to work alongside other very excitable scientists and to add that small piece to the huge puzzle that is understanding our planet. So thank you for listening, and I will be happy to answer some questions later. But for now, I'm going to hand over to Caroline, who's going to be talking to you about what it's like to be a researcher in mi microclimate science. Thanks. OK, let's see how that works. Um, so you can hear me and you can see me? Great. Mm. Well, that did not work so well. Let's try one more. Okay, here we go. Yes, all good. Looks great. Yes, hello everybody. I'm Caroline Greiser and I'm a, a microclimate scientist. So I will tell you uh, here what a microclimate scientist is doing, uh, why this is important, how I got there and why one should even consider uh, becoming a climate scientist or a scientist in general. I did my PhD, or I finished my PhD last year here at Stockholm University at the Department of Plant Ecology, and now I'm still working here as a researcher. So what is microclimate? Microclimate is the climate near the ground, opposed to the climate uh, in the free atmosphere, what we often are talking about. The climate near the ground is uh, very important because that's the climate that many species actually experience, even us. So uh, you, I, I guess when you look at these photos here, uh, you have a very intuitive feeling of where the warm and sunny and dry places are and where it's cold and wet uh, and shadowy. So um, in microclimate or microclimates are these uh, small scale differences very close to the ground, like you have over a very short distance over, over meters or decimeters, or yeah, well, let's say over meters, you have very strong temperature differences. And those uh, differences matter. I uh, work in forests, so I'm very interested in forest microclimate. And uh, the specialty with forest microclimate is that uh, temperature differences are mostly created by the vegetation itself. Like if you have a clear cut or if you have a dense forest, that makes like a huge difference in what temperature you experience close to the ground. Uh, the challenge with microclimate is that it's not captured in these standard climate maps or standard climate data. So weather station measure climate at two meter high, uh, two meter height in open flat surfaces. Uh, so all this microclimate variation is not captured by weather stations and climate grids come often in a very coarse resolution. So the best grids that we uh, as ecologists often are using uh, come on a one kilometer resolution. So that means like you have a one square kilometer, you have one average temperature value. And that of course, again, uh, it, it hides a lot of small scale variation. And I'm very interested in finding these uh, small cold places and warm places in the landscape, trying to find out like wh why, why it's cold and warm, and also how um, plants and animals can make use of these cold and warm spots. Why is microclimate science important? Um, well, humans change the global climate, but they also change microclimate, for example, via forest management. Um, and that makes that microclimate and microclimate management can buffer or boost climate change impacts. So if you have global warming and additional forest clearing, you maybe create even warmer places in the landscape, at least when we talk about summer maximum temperature. So 
So as a forest microclimate scientist, I measure microclimate, I make microclimate maps, and I study the impact of microclimate on biodiversity. How do I measure microclimate? Uh, well, I can't put out a weather station at every other meter, so I need to uh, use other techniques. And what I use are small uh, temperature loggers. Uh, sometimes they also uh, measure humidity. So the, the first logger on the left side, I brought one here. I tried to hold it very close to the camera. It's just the size of a fingernail. Um, it's uh, just a, a small battery and a sensor and, and a data storage uh, all in one. So also pretty cheap. So we used a lot of them in my first project. Uh, they turned out to be very bad. <laughs> um, not made for outdoors. Uh, so and during the last years, they have been more adv advanced loggers um, uh, developed. So now I'm using something like this. Uh, that is a TMS4 logger that mimics a plant that and it measures the temperature in the rooting zone at the soil surface and then some centimeters up in the air. So I spread all these loggers out in the forest. I work in the Swedish central Swedish landscape. And with all this data, I can create microclimate maps on a very high resolution. And um, so you, you see like an example of a, of a microclimate map for summer maximum temperature, like for a warm summer day. Um, and you also see how they depict like the, the forest landscape. So you have the warm, the very warm places on the open clear cuts and the cold, cooler places and dense forest. But the, uh, the big part or the biggest part of my work is actually on the biological impacts of microclimate. So in my PhD, I wanted to find out uh, how species uh, make use of microclimate at their range margins. And for example, I want to find out if species can hide from the rising heat and cold microclimates. And if so, where and why? So would they hide in cold places because they like it cold or do they hide there because they are just not so, so competing so well in the warm places? And that involved a lot of free aid work, at least in the first uh, in the first two years, I was out many, many weeks um, in the Swedish forest, running around trying to find plants, natural populations and figure out in which microclimates they grow, but also planting species out there and testing how they do in cold and warm places in the forest. And with that come a lot of ups and downs of field work, of course, um, but it is Although it is only a small part uh, of our work, it's, it's still a big motivation, I think, for all of us that have talked today. And again, um, it's mainly computer work. So analyzing your data, writing and reading other people's work and building that knowledge. Uh, how did I get there? <laughs> well, uh, you may be surprised, but I, wouldn't, I didn't want to be a <laughs> microclimate scientist. When I was in school, I loved birds and I did a lot of bird watching. I worked at bird observatories, did bird inventories and bird ringing, like catching and putting small rings on them and all of that. So um, I wanted to study biology and I uh, checked out the program at the German university. Oh yeah, and then I wanted to move to Sweden, of course. That was the other dream and at that I managed. <laughs> so, so I wanted to study biology and uh, I met other students uh, in that town there and they said, uh, well, actually all the bird watchers, they study landscape ecology. So figure, or try, try to check out that program. Uh, so I looked up landscape ecology and that was, uh, that was a very attractive program. So it was a so-called diploma where bachelor and master were merged. So I had like a, a five years diploma program at the university. And that combined all the interesting bits of biology uh, with the interesting bits of physical geography, including climate. So um, I learned a lot about birds and plants <laughs> and other animals, but also like water, soil, climate, landscape history and, and, and humans and all this. Um, and, and then I did, <laughs> I moved to peatlands. Um, mostly because you probably have noticed that yourself. Some 
some teachers, some classes are just more inspiring than others. And, um, and I found the Peatland group at our university uh, really cool and really inspiring. So I did both my bachelor and my master project um, on peatland archives and on all these different layers of past vegetations and of past climates. So I looked at um, small plant remains, but also on pollen and uh, charcoal from, from fires and all of that. And I uh, and after I, I finished my master, I wanted to continue uh, with a PhD after some break and work and traveling, <laughs> I wanted to do a PhD. And I uh, wanted also to continue with this um, paleoecology, like ecology of the past. And I started a PhD in a, at another German university about climate and vegetation history at Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania. And I learned a very important personal lesson that sounds cool as not enough for a PhD project. It uh, was not just my thing. And I felt that after some months that I, I didn't really, uh, it, the landscape didn't fit me, that the system didn't fit me, the questions were not interesting enough to devote like several years of my life to that project. So I quit it after half a year. And then I started this PhD here in, in Stockholm uh, that involved running around in the Swedish forest. And that was exactly my thing. And I'm really happy about the decision, although it was very difficult back then. Uh, but while being there, I saw some cool birds, <laughs> of course. <clears throat> so can I call myself a climate scientist? Actually not. I'm, a, I'm an ecologist. But I've been learning a lot about climate while studying birds and peatlands and plants and also being part of the Bolin Center. Uh, I do research on climate impacts on biodiversity and I have learned enough and understand enough now to be very concerned about the current climate crisis and some of their proposed solutions. And that leads me also to uh, why should one even considering becoming a climate scientist or a scientist in general? Well, we all depend on the atmosphere. We all depend on climate. And this atmosphere is really vulnerable. And um, it's also very complex. Climate is difficult. Climate is complex. And we need people to understand this complexity. To appreciate it, to conserve it, to protect it, and also to find solutions for the current crisis. And as you have seen now from all three of us, that there are very different approaches to climate. You can study glaciers, you can study clouds, you can study the forest. Um, and even if you don't plan for it, you can end up as a so-called climate scientist. <laughs> and so my last slide is about Researcher's Desk, which is an organization that I joined recently because I am concerned. I'm a concerned scientist and uh, I would like to learn more about climate and I would also like to help people to understand climate and climate change. And that's exactly the agenda of Researcher's Desk. So I uh, join Wednesday seminars where researchers and experts talk about climate and climate related issues. Um, the group also offers Friday for Future, Fridays for Future lectures. Uh, we have a YouTube channel and of course we're on Facebook and all of that. So um, that is one way of learning about climate without becoming a climate scientist. And with that, I would like to close. Uh, thanks for listening. And we are all very curious to hear your questions. Thank you so much, Carolina, Ohana, Og Caroline, and now I'm confused whether I should speak English or Swedish. Uh, I guess the idea is that we're now open for question and answers. It is absolutely okay to ask your questions in Swedish. Laila is nodding, yes, and all of you are nodding. Uh, so please feel free as to post the questions in the language that you like, Swedish or English. And you all did great talks, all the three of you. I really enjoyed them. But now I leave the floor open to uh, our audience uh, and questions from the audience. Yes, so hi everyone. My name is Laila Islamovic and I work as a communicator here at the Budin Center for Climate Research. And I am here today to provide uh, Carolina, Caroline and Hanna their, um, your guys' questions to them. 
So please feel free to use the Q&A function or the raise hand function, and you find them in the toolbar that is horizontal at the bottom of your Zoom window. Um, if you raise your hand, we will ask you to share audio. And in the Q&A, you can just write your questions. And we have a question from Sheila Heath. This talk was really excellent. Has it been recorded and will it be available for me to use with my gymnasium students at a later date? Uh, I think I can answer this question, um, Sheila. Yes, we are recording this and all of the presentations will be available at bolin.su.se um, later on after the climate festival. So you will be able to use it with your students. Let's see. And there are no stupid questions. So feel free to ask away, use the Q&A um, if you do not want to use audio or camera. And we have an anonymous question here that is asking, what was the most fun part about getting your PhD? Anyone who feels, feel free to answer it, any one of you. I mean, I think all of us really enjoy the field work. Um, I think, yeah. But I also want to say that not all climate scientists do field work. There are also people who only do modeling, uh, for example, only sit by the computer and so on. But I think for us, it's field work is really a big thing. Although we don't do it that much, uh, it's always refreshing to get out and see it with your own eyes. Yeah, I definitely agree. The field work aspects a great, great part of the PhD. Uh, and getting, getting to go to areas that you would never usually get to go to. Like I definitely wouldn't be going up to Svalbard. Um, if I wasn't doing a PhD or going across to this glacier in the middle of nowhere in Norway. Um, so that's, yeah, that's a really lovely part. But I also really enjoy the teaching aspect as well. I like that we get a chance to actually then sort of, because you can go into a bit of a bubble sometimes when you're in your PhD and you're working on your project and you go so far into that and then you get to take a step back. Um, so when you're teaching, you get to interact with people from all sorts of different backgrounds. I find that really exciting to see sort of how other people have ideas on these different topics and to get to go into other topics as well, but within the same sort of area. That's really nice. Okay, to add on that, um, of course, the fieldwork, yes. Um, but I must say that I also love like to, to meet other enthusiastic scientists, regardless of which field. I just love like to, to share ideas or to, to, to learn new things, but also just to, to discuss things uh, and then like meeting people. And I, I, I was missing that a little bit sometimes during school when, when you didn't find your buddies, but in science, like you often find your peers. <laughs> yeah, the social part actually too. Thank you. We have a question here from Matilda. Thank you for this talk. It was very inspirational for someone who is just getting started with their university education. How do you balance all the work you have to do surrounding real world issues with rest and relaxation so it doesn't become too much? <laughs> Caroline. Is that me? <laughs> yes, that's you. It looks like you want to answer this question. <laughs> Well, I think you're, you're, everybody learns it the hard way or they're, I mean, you have to go through it. I guess you have to come to your limits to feel like now I really need to restructure something. Otherwise, I'm, I, this is not sustainable. I will not manage that level. And, and, um, and everybody starts very ambitious and, and hardworking and so, but, but um, I have always uh, tried to write down my hours. I know that P there are PhD students that just uh, that work uh, more than 40 hours a week, although we are paid for full time 40 hours. But I've always like written down my hours. Uh, I did extra hours, but then I took off uh, other days. So I was very, I was try I tried to be very correct with that. Um, <laughs> and then 
Well, I had uh, I had another hobby um, that was very time consuming. So um, so I that 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 really forced me also to not work too much. Uh, but I must say it is really difficult now because I became a mom. Uh, I have a two years old son uh, who was basically sick the entire March and February, which was a really intense period also at work. And it is, uh, well, in Swedish you say, so you just need to accept it and, and, and need to adjust your ambition level. You need to make presentations that are not perfect. You don't train them anymore so much. You just make them, you know, you just use old slides. Uh, you do, you have to do the 80% level. Thank you. Hannah or Carolina, do you guys want to add something to this question? Um, yeah, I think also um, I completely agree with what Caroline said about being, yeah, sort of maybe, yeah, figuring out for you how much is a suitable amount to be working and then trying to structure your uh, time around that. And also surrounding yourself with other people who can kind of recognize when they, they maybe think, oh, like you need to take some more time back. And yeah, I think having people that are like good friends, both within academia, so understand the sort of work that you're doing and how it's like very changeable hours, but also people outside academia to give you a different perspective as well. Because um, sometimes, yeah, within the academic bubble, you can feel like, oh, everyone's always working. And then you've got friends from outside and you suddenly realize, oh no, that's maybe I should go a bit more with that sort of structure. Uh, so yeah, it's, um, having other people, I think, to check up on you is, important yeah and that's what i was thinking about when i said uh, beginning of my talk that it's a bit strange to be both a, a student and an employee at the same time because i think when you do your your bachelor and master you is also you also have to put restrictions on yourself to not study too much for example you don't have that kind of working hours that, that you do in a in a normal job um, so maybe you learn already during your education that you have to put some kind of limits and what works for you and so on but then when you go to the PhD it's not as uh, it's a very long project of four to five years and then that can become challenging to understand when you have to put more and less time on something so I think for field work we all put much more work than normally but then you have to also be respectful to yourself and you know take time off and it's also very important to have a supervisor that acknowledges that i think uh, that you need time off sometimes thank you so much i think we have time to take one last question and we have one here from carolina lagerqvist and this question is in swedish Så, tack för en inspirerande föreläsning. Vet ni vad ni kommer att göra då ni är klara med era doktorander? Vet ni vilka möjligheter som finns och hur ser det ut med jobb? Yeah, this, uh, this is, uh, it's always, and an, I think a lot of people go into their PhD without knowing if they want to continue within research or not. And that's maybe something that you figure out afterwards. Uh, but there we actually have yesterday even we had a, a, a whole day talking about what kind of um, what kind of things you can do with a PhD if you don't want to stay doing research um, what you could use you learn a lot of things not only about your topic but also how to manage your project and how to write long reports and that can be useful for any kind of job afterwards. Hannah or Caroline, does anyone want to add something? Um, yeah, I think I think throughout my PhD, it changes a lot of the time what I what I think I want to do. I keep I'll decide, oh, this is I'm really interested in this. This is, I want to do this, and then suddenly something else comes along, and I'm like, oh, actually no, that would be that would be a better use. So um, yeah, I think yeah, the school. The, I guess the big thing is between going in, continuing down the academic route, or going into something outside academia. That's the first sort of pick between between those um but I think that 
as a PhD, as um, Carolina was saying, that you, you have the skills to apply to like a lot of different areas. You don't necessarily have to stay within your narrow field because within the PhD, you do go very narrowly down into a certain topic, but then you can come back out and you've still got so many other things that you can apply what you've learned to. So there's a lot of options out there afterwards. Thank you, Hannah. Do you want to add something, Caroline? Um, yeah, I mean, as I have finished my PhD, I had to make that decision. <laughs> so I just wanted to share that I, I would love to stay in science. I feel that this is really my thing, but I didn't know before. And, and I so far in my career, I, I did what I really in, was where I felt an, felt an enthusiasm for. And that also kept the motivation up and that kept me going. And I think this is really important, like to find these things. As I said, like I quit at one thing because it was, I, I didn't feel I had the motor for that. Um, um, but uh, I've also joined like different seminars and I know there are options outside academia. I could work in, uh, I don't know, Skook Stevenson, for example, <laughs> uh, or like uh, in a consultant uh, company, I mean, there, there are options. And I cannot move like right now with my family. That makes the academic options a bit limited. But Thank things you. we'll figure out. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you to all three of you for a fantastic and inspirational talk. And thank you to all the attendees for your great questions. Um, right now, we will go on a lunch break, but at 1 p.m., we have the talk Klimatkrisen och vad kan vi lära oss från pandemin with Alistair Skelton. So make sure to be back here at 1 p.m. for that. And thank you so much for listening.